I'm going to hand over the mic to them and then they will take over the proceedings from here. from the book of John in the quiz competition not just that uh, for the beginners to second standard we have yeah beginners to second standard we ask questions to each and every child e the set of 20 question was asked to each and every child and uh, the winners were selected based on how they did well and uh, for, for the second two groups we had two rounds first we had a written test where they had to write a test and those who did well in the written test were chosen to be a part of the quiz which was the final round so i'm going to read out the winners of uh, each of these uh, winners from each of these groups uh, first we'll begin with beginners to second standard yeah, and before that, I request Amy to come over to give away the prizes. <laughs> yeah, we start with beginners to second standard, Anaya, Eva, Ruth Ida, Ruth, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait. wait. So that's Eva. Here, here, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth, Ida, Jeremy, Suchika, Joy, Joshua. Suchika is not here. Now the second prize winners: Benita, Rachel, and Esther. The third prize winners, Natalie and Natanya. Next is uh, for the written test for the group third to sixth standard and the first prize winners are Rebecca and Satya. The second prize goes to Megan. Now we have the winners of the group quiz from third to sixth standard. The first prize goes to Stefan. Second, pr sorry, the first prize winners, Stefan, Nayantara, Simone, Deepa and Mitrin. And the runners up, Megan, Chitra, Shreha, Aisri and Renan.
Next we have the winners of the written test for standard 7 to 11. First prize goes to Nisha. A special mention, Nisha is the only kid who got 20 out of 20 in the written test. The second prize goes to Jonathan. Zachary. And the third prize goes to Shweta, Tanya, Jerry, and Shreyas. Next, the winners of the group quiz from standard 3 to 6. First prize goes to Nisha, Shweta, Varlakshmi, and Jonathan. And the runners up goes to Sam, Abby, Kimberly, and Lydia. Thank you. I know they're not here, but let's put our hands for children's such teachers. I really appreciate all the efforts. Uh, and what's going on. Uh, as was announced uh, in the video, we are working on putting together a new children's church curriculum and uh, uh, the idea behind the curriculum is that um, we'd like to lay a really solid foundation for our children so that really by the time they come through, come out of the children's church, which is by the, I think by the time they're, what's it, 12th standard? 12th. Huh? Okay, by the time they finish 12th grade, uh, they sh should be in a position to, to serve God, to do ministry. That's the idea with, the, with this new children's church curriculum. Uh, we want to equip them, give them a strong foundation of the word and all the things that we teach in the adult church. We want them to learn it so that by the time they are uh, 17 or 16, 17 and they finish children's church, they'll be ready to actually serve God. Amen. We all went very quiet suddenly. It's like, oh no. <laughs> but that's what we're doing. And so if, uh, uh, if you'd like, we need people who help write the curriculum. But of course, you need to be strong in the word of God yourself uh, before you could do that. We've selected the topics and uh, selected what we want to deliver. Uh, we've also got the, uh, a lot of the content, but it has to be uh, um, made children's church type of material. And that's where we need help. So if you'd like to do that, then please get in touch with Pastor Selena or um, uh, Deepika. So uh, Deepika has joined our, our staff as a, as a full-time staff. She's, her primary responsibility is help with the writing of the children's church content, but she's all, she will also be involved in other things uh, with Catalyst and so on. Uh, men, very important, January 26th. What's happening? Other than you get to sleep in because it's Republic Day. <laughs> January 26th is our men's conference. All right, so we just want to have all the men come out. Uh, it's at Inf Infantry Ho Hotel. Bring your kids. If they're 13 years and above, bring your fathers. Um, we just want all men to come together. Uh, we are hoping to be able to screen the movie Courageous. For the men, right? It's very likely we will be able to get the DVDs uh, out. The DVDs are supposed to be released on the 17th, but we've got access to get it prior to that date. So it's very likely we'll get the DVD. And so we want to screen the courage of the movie at uh, the men's conference. Of course, we'll get a license to do that as well. So men, please make it to the men's conference. It's on 26th of January, Republic Day. It's a holiday. Uh, you just have to come over to the Infantry Hotel, 8.30 in the morning. We'll be done by 2.30, and I believe we'll have a good time. All the men said amen. amen. Right. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let's just make our declaration this morning. 
Uh, if you brought your Bible, I just want you to hold it in your hand. Just uh, raise it high up. Say this out loud with me. This is God's word. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive his word, I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated, please. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start with a couple of verses from the 6th chapter of Ephesians. And uh, we'll come back to this, this episode. But I want to read first of all from Ephesians chapter 6. We'll read verses 10 through 12. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 12. Paul writes, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This morning I want to spend some time talking to us about life's battles and about winning life's battles. In Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 12, the verses that we just read, Paul is encouraging us as believers and he says, Brethren, I want you to be strong in the Lord. You be strong. You do what you need to do to be strong spiritually. To be strong in God and be empowered with the strength that he gives. Be empowered with the might that comes from him. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And he says, put on the whole armor of God. For what reason? So that you can stand against all the wiles, against all the schemes, against all the devices of the enemy. And then he goes on to tell us, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. I mean, we're not engaging in a physical battle. But we're really involved in a spiritual battle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spirits of wickedness. So what he's awakening each one of us as believers, he's saying, you know, people, I want you to be strong in God and derive your strength and keep growing in this power that comes from God. And take on the whole armor of God so that you can stand because there is an enemy out there who has all kinds of devices, all kinds of schemes, all kinds of ways and maneuvers in trying to destabilize, destabilize you in trying to come against you. So you need to be strong. Because we are fighting a spiritual battle. And then he tells us that this enemy is very organized. That the principalities, powers, mights uh, and ru uh, rulers of darkness and spirits of wickedness. So we are fighting against a spiritual enemy. Against demonic powers. Amen. So I want to spend some time talking about life's battles. The reality is all of us will have many battles to go through in life. It's just normal to be in the middle of a fight, in the middle of a battle. It's normal. Amen? So don't get all upset if you're saying, man, 
Why am I in a battle? Why do I have to fight? It's normal to be in a battle as you're journeying through life as a believer. Now, just for our discussion or for our uh, meditation, if you will, this morning, I've tried to categorize life's battles into these four main areas. There is a battle for faith. There is a battle for faith. Secondly, there is a battle for purity. Thirdly, there is a battle for our spiritual inheritance. And fourthly, there's a battle for our destiny. There's a battle for faith. The devil, you know, just because you are a believer and just because you made a decision to follow Christ doesn't mean that you will never have doubts concerning your faith in Jesus. The enemy will try to do something to rob you and rob me of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a battle, a very basic battle, the battle for faith in Jesus. Then there is a battle for purity. If the devil cannot shake us in our faith, he's going to at least try to neutralize us by causing us to compromise in our lifestyle. There's a battle for purity. We'll talk about these things. And then there is a battle for our spiritual inheritance. If the devil cannot get you to compromise on a pure life, He'll try to hold back what is rightfully yours. Spiritual inheritance. So you got to contend for what is yours in Christ. And then there's a battle for destiny. To fulfill God's call on your life. To fulfill the very purpose for which God has kept you here on earth. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk about these things and I want to come back to the book of Ephesians to just look at the background, the foundation that Paul laid in chapters 1, 2 and 3 before he could tell us in, verse, in chapter 6 that you're fighting against these principalities, powers, mights and uh, uh, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness. Before he could tell us you're in this battle, what kind of a foundation did he lay? We want to look at that and make that as a basis for which you and I can win life's battles. Let me just talk about the battle for faith. If you turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. You know, many of us make the wrong assumption that, you know, just because I'm a believer, just because I go to church, uh, just because I hear a lot of sermons, I'm strong in my faith and nothing is going to cause me to go astray from the faith. And that is indeed a very dangerous assumption to make. Because in this episode, the first episode of Timothy, Paul brings to our attention a couple of scenarios where people actually depart, stray, or shipwreck their faith. Look at these with me. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Paul says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. So saying, Timothy, you know, you're in a warfare. And I want you to do something. I want you to hold on to your faith with a good conscience, with a clear conscience. With some having put away, meaning some people have disregarded maintaining a clear conscience. And what has been the consequence? They have shipwrecked their faith. In other words, if you and I want to maintain our faith, we've also got to have a good, come on, a what? A good conscience. You've got to maintain a clear conscience. If you disregard a good conscience, Paul says these people can shipwreck their faith. Destroy their own faith. We'll come back to this good conscience bit in a few minutes. 
chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. They'll go astray from the faith. There's a battle for our faith. Why would they depart? Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Once again, that issue of conscience. Their own conscience is seared with a hot iron. And because of that, they consequently actually go astray, go away from the faith. Chapter 6. Two more reasons or two more scenarios where people depart from the faith. In chapter 6, in verses 9 and 10, he says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So why do people stray from the faith? In this case he says, because of the love of money and because of greediness, they stray from the faith. And lastly, in verses 20 and 21 he says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Four scenarios where people actually lose their faith. In chapter 1 he says they shipwreck their faith. In chapter 2, he says they depart from the faith. Chapter 4, verse, uh, he says they depart from the faith. In chapter 6, he, he says two scenarios where people stray from the faith. And therefore, in chapter 6, verse 12, in this whole, and all of us writing, in chapter 6, verse 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Amen? There is a battle of faith. There's an enemy who will attempt to dislocate our faith. Who will try to get us to stray from the faith. Now, the scenario that he talked about in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 6. Where people dis uh, go astray or stray from the faith because of a love for money and greed. Is that we can understand. You know, people get so ensnared by the pursuit of money and greediness for money that they forget about maintaining their walk with God and they just slowly stray from the faith. We can understand that. The scenario you talked about in verse 20 and 21 of chapter 6 where he says, avoid this thing called opposition of false knowledge. Because if you get entangled in that, you can stray away from the faith. That we can understand. Because there are all kinds of humanistic ideas out in the world. Philosophies. Big names who claim all kinds of things. And when we start to think in their, their way and embrace their, their way of thinking, it can cause us to go away from the faith. So we got to be careful what we hear and what we listen to and pay attention to. Are you with me so far? But then this issue of conscience, which he addresses both in chapter 1 and chapter 4, is something we need to spend a few moments on. I want to spend a few moments on that. Because in chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, Paul says, Timothy, hold your faith with a good conscience, because some who have done away with a good conscience, they have actually shipwrecked their faith. And in chapter 4 verse 1 and 2 he says, you know, believers who have seared their conscience as with a hot iron, what has happened to them? They have departed from the faith and they've got trapped in seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. 
So this clear conscience, maintaining a clear conscience is so important to have a life that of strength and stability in the faith. Are you with me so far? What is the conscience? The New Testament talks a lot about the conscience. Very simply put, the conscience is the law of God written in the heart of every human being. Whether you are a believer or not, you have a conscience. You're born with it. God's law has been impregnated into your inner being, your core, your heart. And so inside you, whether you've been to church or not, whether you've read your Bible or not, whether you've read a, heard a sermon or not, inside you there is something that says, this is right and this is wrong. That's your conscience. It's the voice of your spirit. The voice of your heart. In Romans chapter 2, Paul has written a lot about the conscience, but this morning I'll just pick up a few Verses for, to help us understand the conscience and also talk about the role of a conscience in the life of the believer. Because if a believer disregards his conscience, he can actually lose his faith. Is what Paul is saying. In Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Paul says, For when Gentiles, he's referring to the unbelievers, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. And between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. There is the conscience. What is it? It's the law of God written in the hearts of people. That something inside them, within themselves, within them says, either excuses or accuses them. Something inside you that tells you, this is right and this is wrong. That's the conscience. Amen? And it's inside every human being. Paul says, even the unbeliever. Who doesn't have the law, uh, doesn't have the word of God. Yet inside of him, there is something that says, that accuses him or excuses him. Something that says, this is, this is wrong and this is right. They have a conscience inside. Amen? And then in chapter 9 of Romans... Here's the work of the conscience in the life of the believer. Chapter 9 verse 1. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. So what is the, what is the role of the conscience in the life of the believer? It bears witness with the Holy Spirit. So a believer has two things inside him that is saying something is right and something is wrong first it's his, it's a conscience inside him and second it's the holy spirit now the conscience and the holy spirit always will agree because the conscience is the law of god impregnated in your heart the holy spirit is god inside you telling it's right and wrong so your conscience will always agree with the holy spirit amen which means that you are not excused if you say, I have no leading. See, it's very nice Christian terminology. We all use to excuse ourselves. I don't feel led. Give him a slap and say, what is your conscience telling you? <laughs> we, may, we know how to make excuses, you know. I don't feel God leading me. But listen, you may not feel the Holy Spirit. But what is your conscience telling you? Because the conscience will always agree with the Holy Spirit. It will bear witness with the Spirit. Amen? And it's there in every believer. Every human being has a conscience. However, the reality is that the conscience can be suppressed 
You know, in John chapter 8, we have an interesting scenario. You know, these, these religious people brought a woman caught in adultery. They brought her to Jesus. And they said, Lord, according to the law, we have to stone her because we caught her in adultery. Jesus writes on the ground. He says, he looks up and he says, whoever has, uh, has no sin, you be the first one to throw the stone. And he continues writing. After some time, he looks up and he sees no one there. They're all gone. And John chapter 8 and verse 9 says, Each one pricked by his, convicted by his own conscience, dropped the stone and went. What happened? They were convicted by their own conscience. But it is possible for us to suppress our conscience and in fact come to a place that Paul wrote in 1st Timothy 4 verse 2 have a conscience seared with hot iron meaning it's not like you're taking a, bar, a rod of iron and putting it in your chest that's not it it's coming to a place where you have killed your own conscience for believers So when you seared your own conscience and forget about listening to the Holy Spirit, that's like too far off, you know. When you've seared your own conscience, there's nothing anymore in a believer to tell him what he's doing is right or wrong. And a believer at that point is very dangerous because he can depart from the faith. Are you listening to me? Do we all understand this? So, we've got to keep our faith with a good conscience. Nurture your conscience. Feed it with the word of God. Don't suppress it. Your conscience says, this is right, this is wrong. This is right, is wrong. Don't make excuses like I don't feel the Holy Spirit. I don't feel the presence of God in this place. Hey, even the unbeliever knows what's right and wrong because the law of God's in his heart. He doesn't sing verse, thousand worship songs to feel the presence of God. There's a conscience inside him that tells him what's right and wrong. So how much more should you and I as believers in our own hearts, you know, Yes, we struggle. Sometimes we fight. Sometimes we, we feel uneasy. What is it? It's our own conscience telling us, you're right, you're wrong. Well, just one more thought and we'll move on. First John chapter 3. Verses 21 and 22. First John 3, 21 and 22. John writes, he says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, if our heart does not condemn us, that means if our conscience is clear, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep His commandments and do what is, right, what is pleasing in His sight. He says, you know, if you've got a clear conscience, then you can go to God with confidence. And you can ask what you want because, and you'll receive it because you are keeping his commandments and doing what is pleasing in his sight. So a clear conscience is going to help you keep the commandments of God and do what's pleasing in his sight. It gives you therefore confidence in God's presence. Amen? So this morning in our battle for faith... There are things that the enemy may throw in our way to uh, cause us to go away from the faith. It could be, you know, this false knowledge and all kinds of reasoning that try to destabilize your faith. It could be a love for money that causes you to go away. But very importantly, you and I must protect our faith by walking with a clear conscience. Amen? This morning, for some of us, our conscience needs to be resurrected. 
Because as Christians, we've done a very good job of suppressing the voice of our own conscience. And there's nothing in ours anymore that tells us you're right and you're wrong. Resurrect your conscience. Feed it with the law of God. Pay attention to it. Amen. And they're going to kind of, for example, they're going to, suppose somebody's going to steal something. Inside of them, something says, you know, that's not right. You're taking something that's not yours. But you know, I'm going to give it to the Lord. <laughs> See, that's how a Christian suppresses his own conscience. I'm going to give it to the Lord. No, the Holy Spirit said, dude, it's wrong. <laughs> Simple. If you don't believe a pastor, ask an unbeliever. <laughs> He'll tell you it's wrong. He's simply speaking out of his conscience. Not complicating it with an angel of the Lord appeared, the Holy Spirit said, nothing. It's wrong. Finished. But we spiritualize things and in the process we sear our own conscience. So there is a battle for faith. There is a battle for purity. You know, if the enemy cannot destabilize our faith, he's going to encourage us to live compromised lives. Why? So that we can, we, he neutralizes our usefulness to God. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 19. Now through the first part of verse 22. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 onwards. Nevertheless the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that is from whatever is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. Paul is saying, look, God's stand is very clear. Let those who name the name of Christ depart from sin. He says, if you will, if anyone, if anyone will cleanse himself, whatever is dishonorable, then he will be a vessel of honor, set apart and fit for the master's use, prepared for every good work. Meaning if you and I want to be useful in God, Purity is not an option. Amen? So here's the second battle. The battle for purity. The enemy will encourage us to live compromised lives so that it diminishes our usefulness for the kingdom of God. And I'm not talking about the big sins. You know, I don't smoke. I don't chew pan. Sometimes I chew gum. I... Uh, I mean, you know, I'm not talking about all those external things that we get so hung up about. Very often the enemy uses little things, small things, to neutralize us. You know, if a pot of water has a small leak, it's still leaking. One day, it's going to become an empty vessel. We think, well, it's just a small leak. It's okay. No, 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 no. Even a small leak is going to make you empty one day. So there's a battle for purity. And you and I must make a determined choice that, look, I want to be a vessel of honor that God can use.
The third is a battle for our spiritual inheritance. Which means God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Every blessing from heaven is yours. Healing is yours. Success is yours. Prosperity is yours. Triumph and victory is yours. It's provided in the word of God as part of his promises. But then there's an enemy that comes to steal, kill and destroy. He tries to interject his works in, every er in different areas of our life trying to destroy and you and I must stand up and fight for what is our spiritual inheritance. Amen? And there is a battle for our destiny. Right there in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 Paul says I have fought the good fight I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So he won the battle for, of faith. He kept the faith till the very end. He was also able to finish his destiny. I have finished the race. I have completed my destiny. What God called me to do. I finished it. There is a battle for your destiny. If the devil cannot win the battle for faith, if he cannot win the battle for purity in your life, if he cannot win the battle to keep you off of your spiritual inheritance, if he still succeeds in keeping you from your destiny, you've still lost that bit of value of being here on earth. True, you've kept your faith. True, you've lived a good life. True, you've been successful. But you've not fulfilled the call of God. So there's a battle for God's call on your life, for your destiny. Amen. So Paul says, going back to Ephesians 6.10 that we read in the beginning, Paul says, be strong, brothers. Be strong in the Lord. Derive your strength from God. Because, and put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand. Because there's an enemy there. But before he could get to chapter 6, there are some things, there's a foundation he laid in chapter 1, 2, and 3, which is what I want us to look at and then close. In what context are we fighting? In what context are all of life's battles happening? How must we perceive the battles that we are going through currently? In Ephesians chapter 1, I'm just speaking of these verses to give us the context in which life's battles are happening. How we must approach these battles for our faith, purity, our spiritual inheritance and our destiny. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul says, talking about these principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spirits of wickedness. In chapter 1, Paul, verses 20 and 21, Paul says that, talking about God and the work at which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So what did Paul say right there in chapter 1? He said, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and he's seated on the highest throne. But all of these principalities and powers and demonic spirits all underneath his feet. And he is in this position for the church. What's the context in which we are fighting? Number one, we are fighting an enemy that has been conquered. Amen? We are fighting an enemy that has been conquered, that has been defeated. So when you are fighting your battles... 
Whether it's a battle for faith, the purity, or a spiritual inheritance of your destiny, understand that the enemy that's coming against you is really an enemy that has already been defeated. Christ has conquered it, conquered the enemy, and is seated on the highest throne with all of these principalities, powers, and underneath his feet, and he's there for the church. The second thing that Paul brings out in chapter 2, he says about you and me, verses 4 through 6, he says, But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the second context is this. You are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms with all these principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spirits of wickedness underneath your feet. So. This battle that you're going to fight in Ephesians 6 is in this context. That these demon spirits are really under your feet. And you are fighting from a place of victory. You are in a place of dominion and authority. Amen. You heard us say this many, many times. You're not contending for victory. You're contending from a place of victory. Amen. You have already been destined to win. John wrote it like this in 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 and verse 4. He says in 1 John chapter 5 verse 1, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And then in verse 4 he says, in 1 John 5 verse 4 he says, Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. See the case is settled. You are. An overcomer. Whoever is born of God. Overcomes the world. You are an overcomer. So when you are facing your battles. Face them. Knowing this. My Jesus. Has conquered every devil. That's coming against me. Second. Every devil knows. They're underneath my feet. The devil knows that I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. It's time that I awaken to that reality and began to exercise my authority. Amen. That same verse in 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 that says whoever is born of God overcomes the world tells us how to walk in that overcoming life it says and this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith amen have faith in the fact that you are seated with christ in heavenly places have faith in the word of god have a, a dominating kind of faith saying devil you may come against me but you will submit you may have disrupted things in my life, but I will dominate you. I will crush you under my feet. I will conquer. I will come out victorious. I will overcome. Because whoever is born of God overcomes the world. I don't know what battles you're going through today. I don't know in which area of life you're facing your battle. But I want to let you know that you are a winner. Because you are in Christ. And you are born of God. And the victory is yours in Jesus Christ. Keep fighting. Don't quit. Amen. And the third context that Paul gives us. In which this whole conflict of Ephesians 6 is happening. In over in Ephesians 3. He says this and we'll just read verses 9 and 10. He says Ephesians 3 verses 9 and 10. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. Who created 
all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. What's he saying? He's saying, you know, I'm just picking up these verses, you can read the whole context, but what Paul is saying is this, that God has an intent, or God has an interest, or God has an objective that through the church, church meaning each one of us, that through his people, God wants to show or demonstrate to these principalities and powers, that means these demon spirits, the greatness of his mercy, the riches of his grace, and the magnitude of his wisdom. And then God wants to show off through you. Amen. So the third thing is this. God wants to be glorified through your life. David put it like this. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemy. So through you, God wants to show to these demon powers how gracious he is, how merciful he is, and how wise he is. God will be glorified through your life. He's got a vested interest to make it happen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, talking about the devil, he says, We are not ignorant of his devices, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Then he jumped down to verse 14, he says, But thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph, to make manifest the fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. He says, God always leads us in a triumphant procession. God always causes us to triumph so that through us, people know how great he is. So what is the context in which you're fighting your battles? It's this, that there's a God who has a vested interest in causing you to triumph so that through you, he can show off his mercy, his grace and his wisdom. Amen. With these three things, you're bound to win. Amen. So whatever it might be, the battle that you're going through today, what are your battles? I don't know. We all have battles. You can win. Because Jesus has every demon under his feet. Secondly, you're sitting with Jesus with every demon under your feet. And thirdly, God's waiting to show off his glory, his mercy, his, his grace, his wisdom through your life. He's going to bring you through to victory. He's going to cause you to triumph. Amen. So now, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because the battle you're fighting, you will win. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our faith. Call the worship team up, please. I want to take a few moments, please, before we close this morning. To just reflect on the message, reflect on the word of God and take some time to pray. Respond to the word this morning. First of all, I want us to pray if there's some of us, perhaps intentionally, perhaps unintentionally, we have suppressed our own conscience. There was a time when your conscience was speaking and telling you, no, 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 you're doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong. But then you fought your own conscience. And today you're in a place where your conscience doesn't bother you anymore. Why? Because it's been seared with a hot iron. It's been killed. 
you're doing wrong and you're fine about it but there was a time that you could remember when you were doing something wrong your conscience was troubling you but you still kept doing it but your conscience was troubling you some of us yielded to the voice of a conscience and we came back and to what was right but there could be some of us who didn't do that you fought your own conscience till the point you killed it and that's a very dangerous place to be Paul says you got to have faith with a good conscience otherwise there are chances you can shipwreck your own faith there are chances you can depart from the faith and get into all kinds of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons and all kinds of things I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who needs to pray a prayer and say God revive my conscience I will be sensitive God I'm sorry for fighting my own conscience this auto mechanism that you placed in every human being to accuse us or excuse us to tell us what's wrong and teach us what's right would you pray right now this morning and say God revive my conscience let the voice of my conscience speak loud and clear once again I will listen I will listen to my own conscience you're placed in me which teaches me what's right and what's wrong morning I just want to encourage you to drink to strengthen yourself in God because all of us go through battles in different areas of life it's a battle for faith sometimes you get confused I shake your faith a bit but this morning you can strengthen yourself in God sometimes there's a battle for purity maybe you've compromised but this morning you can come back to the Lord and say God I want to establish purity in my life so that I can be a vessel of honor fit for your use oh God There's a battle for our spiritual inheritance. Maybe you're fighting for something that you know is yours because it's in the Bible. God promised it for you. Whether it's your home, your family, your marriage, your children, your finances, your job, your whatever it is, God's promised it. You're fighting for it. The battle might seem long. The battle might seem hard. Sometimes it might even seem like you're on the losing side. But I want to encourage you. Your battle is from a place of victory. You're already on the winning side. Jesus has already won your battle for you. Fight the good fight of faith. Keep fighting and you will come through to victory. You will see the promise of God fulfilled in your life. Keep fighting. Keep standing. Be strong in the Lord. Put on the armor of God so that you can stand. Just keep standing. Just keep standing. Just keep standing. Just keep standing. Maybe it's a battle for the call of God, for your destiny. Man may have come against you. The devil may have come against you, trying to rob you of your destiny in God. But stand. 
stand. God will cause you to triumph. God will show off His mercy, His grace, His wisdom through your life. Just stand. Just stand. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong. strong in your faith exercise your authority exercise your dominion over that situation speak your words of faith speak words of authority you are seated in a place of authority the enemy is underneath your feet
of Jesus. We pronounce, we declare your victory in each one of our lives. Over every battle that we might be facing, over every area of our lives, we declare that we are born of God and whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And by faith we speak victory, we speak triumph in every area of our lives in the name of Jesus. God, I just thank you for causing each one of your people to come into a place of triumph, to come into a place of victory, oh God, and to advance in victory, Father. We just thank you in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You are a victor. You are a winner. Now, before we close this morning, we want to take a minute to give an opportunity for anyone here this morning who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe it's your first time in church. Maybe you've been in church many times before, but you've never received Jesus Christ into your life. The Bible says, if you have Jesus, you have life. If you do not have Jesus, you do not have life. So if you're not sure if Jesus Christ lives in you and this morning you would like Jesus to come into your heart, forgive you your sins and bring you new life, make you a child of God and lead you on a path of victory. If you would like to do that and you've never done it before, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. A prayer of invitation to receive Jesus Christ into your life. And those of you watching by television, if you've never done this before, you've never prayed a prayer to receive Jesus Christ into your life, I want you to pray this prayer with me right where you are. Just repeat this after me right now. Say this with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive all my sins. Make me a child of God. Lead me, Lord, into victory. From this day, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. And I will follow you. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Is anyone here this morning and you pray this prayer for the very first time? Could you just slip up your hand? I want to see this. Anybody who prayed this prayer this morning for the very first time? Could you kindly just put your hand up? There, I see a hand there. I see one more, one, one more person up there. One more up there. God bless you. Another one up there. God bless you. Another one up there. Another one right at the back. God bless you. Thank you so much. You've made the greatest decision of your life. Can I ask you to do one more thing? Can you just pick up your bags, whatever you brought with you? Could you just come right up here to meet Pastor Stephen Benny? Pastor Steve, could you put your hand up? Okay. Pastor Stephen Benny is right here. If you could just, if you put your hand up, could you just come down and meet with him right now as soon as we close the service? He's going to give you a New Testament. He also is going to give you a First Steps card. And he's going to go over it with you just to give you some instruction on what actually happened in your life. So if you put your hand up, please, as soon as we close the service, just make your way down from the balcony where you are here. Meet with Pastor Stephen Benny right here in this left corner right here. He's going to give you a New Testament and also he's going to give you a First Steps card card and spend a few moments with you and then you can be free to dismiss let's close arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you though darkness covered the earth and deep darkness the people but the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. First time visitors, if you could make your way to the hallway towards my left. There's a sign up there. First time visitors. Our team will be there to meet with you. God bless you. Right after service, we have a TNT core team meeting. So TNT core team, just head, head to the back of the hall. We'll meet right there. God bless you. Have a great week.